great team. We thank God for His love. We thank God for His peace. How many out there know with me that the Lord has done great things in our lives? If you agree with that, you know it had not been God. I, I've seen where people are falling apart during this time of isolation and struggle. But you know what? We got God on our side. We got the Lord on our side holding us up, blessing us, bringing us home. And I'm just reminded of growing up in church and hearing one of those old annoying sisters, you know, who jump up. I don't know what kind of church you came from, but I came out of one of those churches where people would just break off in the song. Sometimes I like all the other songs you sing, but every now and then you gotta go back and just talk to God. Can you help me this morning? Precious Lord, take my hand. joining us, and we're going right into the Word of God. There is a word from the Lord today. That's where my heart is. My heart is focused on this awesome, ultimate power of God. Can you open your Bibles, your devices, wherever you are? Go to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua. Old Testament, early part of Old Testament, you'll find. Joshua, one of the great patriarchs of our faith. And we're going to look at chapter 7, very um, powerful passage that I think is made for a time like this. We'll start reading at verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of the Lord, children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country and the men went up and viewed Ai. They returned to Joshua and said, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but a few. So they went up of the people, about three thousand men, but they fled before the men of Ai. The men of Ai smote of them about 36 men, for they chased them from before the gate even to Shebarim and smote them in the going down. Wherefore, the hearts of the people melted and became as water, 
And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. He and the elders of Israel put dust upon their head. And Joshua said, At last, O God, wherefore hast thou brought all of this people over the Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us? Would to God we have been content and dwelt on the other side of Jordan. We're looking at this very peculiar trust of circumstances that came to pass. And we can focus on verse 4 where it says, So only about 3,000 men, but they fled before Ai. We're going to speak tonight for as long as the Spirit of the Lord will allow. Stop losing battles you should win. Stop losing battles you should win. 2016 was a landmark year in my life. It was a year I completed some educational goals that I had been trying after a long time, and I reached my goal, and I was excited about that. It was the year that Shiloh Baptist Church reached our centennial. That's right. We were 100 years in existence celebrating God here at Shiloh as a, as a praise church. We've been praising Him that long. It was a year that I was diagnosed with cancer. I know someone might say, well, that's strange that you would talk about or celebrate being diagnosed with cancer, but it really is not if you're a child of God. And the reason it is not if you're a child of God, because just like anybody else who the Lord has healed, and I know there's somebody that can agree, I got stronger from the the situation, and I grew closer to God from the situation, and so I found it was an area to celebrate. Revelation 12 and 11 says, And they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony or the word of their testimony because they counted not their life unto death. Think about that text. It says that real Christians overcome not by being always protected, but we got a testimony. We got something in our background that we can say, I'm not living off of what you tell me about the Lord. I'm living off of what I know the Lord has done in my life. And can I tell you something? The mark of a real believer who's going to be an overcomer is he does not mind, she does not mind telling you how good God has been in their life. So I celebrate everything I went through because I know it was God who brought me through. So 2016 was a landmark year. But one of the most satisfying reasons of 2016 was the fact that the Golden State Warriors were the reigning NBA defending champs, and they were set to play the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, you know I'm about to go with this because I am a LeBron James fan. Some of y'all are not, but here's what happened. Golden State was picked by every professional, everybody out there to win, everybody out there. Cleveland was not given a chance. But I just told you they were being led by who I call the, oh, I'll make some viewers mad right now. I call him the new goat. See, there's the, there's the old goat or the forever goat. In my opinion, that's going to be Michael Jordan. He's going to be a goat. But LeBron James, I don't care what anybody says, unequivocally, I will argue with you that he is the new goat. And you know what? His win, not just recently, but the win that he had in 2016 was uh, something that was unheard of. Matter of fact, that team being led by him set a record that nobody had ever come back from a 3-1 deficit in the finals playoff. Nobody. But LeBron James came back. That's right. Cleveland run. Woo-woo. Cleveland won. I know somebody upset. But here is where the real problem came. The next day, everybody was saying, what happened? Oh, what happened? You know why? Because Golden State lost a battle that they should have won. They had better shooters. They had all the experience. Uh, LeBron James was leading a, a, a group of people that wasn't as many stars. But they won. And this is a theme that as I was preparing for this, I found that goes all throughout um, sports history and all throughout history because it seems like there's a lot of people that have the skills and they have the ability, but somehow they find themselves on the losing 
in. As a matter of fact, we can go back to 1985. Mike, Iron Mike Tyson was set to fight Michael Douglas, or James Buster Douglas, I'm sorry. They are going to fight James Buster Douglas, and watch this. As he was about to fight him, Iron Mike Tyson held the WBA, the WBC, and the IBF heavyweight titles, all three consecutive. He was destroying people. But that night, uh, to a surprise and shocked world, Mike Tyson was KO'd, TKO'd in the 10th round of that fight. Again, the question went off. He shouldn't have never lost that fight. Buster Douglas was only ranked number seven. Or we can go back to that year, 1985, when uh, the Georgetown Hoyas, led by um, John Thompson, who was the first black coach, college coach there was, had led them to a championship the year before. They were the reigning champions of college, a powerhouse led by Patrick Ewing. Nobody thought that lowly Villanova and Wally Semino would actually beat them. And nobody thought that they would win. And if you look around, they actually lost that game to the surprise of everyone. And when you look back, everyone wonder how did it happen? But the most astounding one, so I can just set, let this point go to rest, because here's one that everybody knows, especially both in my age category, my generation. <clears throat> we know now, Iron Mike Tyson was good, but one of the most uh, sought about upsets, one that everybody says is one of the most astounding upsets in history, came from Muhammad Ali, who labeled himself the greatest. You do remember that there was the thriller in the jungle, the rumble in the jungle, and it was a fight between George Foreman, big George Foreman, 42 professional fights, 42 wins, 39 by knockout. Here we have a 32-year-old Muhammad Ali who was worn, punch drunk, and sat out three years because of what they call draft dodging, but we know he sat out because of the fact that he was standing up for his rights, and he came back in, and George Foreman had just destroyed smoking Joe Frazier, and now he was beating folk left and right. But Muhammad Ali proved to be that illicit marketer, proved to be the person who could pull it off, and he rope-a-doped George Foreman and won that fight. Everything, the theme and everything I just told you was they should have won, but they lost. That's what God has me here on assignment for this morning. He has me here to tell some of you that there are some battles. I'm just going to come straight out with it. He said, you've lost some battles that you should have won. And it's not his fault. He's saying, if I could hit you hard, God is saying right now, there are some promises you should have benefited from already. There are some battles you should have won. There are some strongholds you should have conquered by now. There are some blessings that God was waiting to give you, but he couldn't give them to you. But you should have received those blessings by now. There is some contentment and some joy that you should have had a week, a day, a month of contentment. You should have had some more peace. There's some battles you should have won, and you lost those battles. And God wants you to know this morning, just like everybody said when they looked around at all of those historic sports upsets I told you about, what happened? God was looking down from heaven, and what he wants to know is, I gave you the power. I already delivered you. You know what I've done in your life. Why are you sitting there wilding around in sorrow and losing this battle when you got so many victories behind you? God wants us to see clearly this morning that we should not be losing or sorry. There's too many saints sitting around right now allowing the enemy to slowly take you out. And the puzzling thing is, it seems the longer you're saved, the more you get the more you fall down, the more you leak, the more you allow the enemy to come along and just steal what is yours. Man, there was a time when you were on fire. There was a time when you were reading. There was a time when you were worshiping. There was a time you would have told the devil, you're not taking this from me. But God wants me to know, and I'm, being, I'm hitting you straight out. God said, there are too many battles. You need to stop losing battles that you should win because sooner or later, it's going to be too late. Now, somebody might say, well, are you talking about, you know, one of those prosperity messages that everything should be okay? No, that's not what I said. I said you have battles. 
But some of the battles you lost, you lost not because of God, but because of you. And you should have won them. And I'm standing on some great gospel ground right now. Remember what I told you. When you're standing on the word of God, understand God never tells you to do something he wouldn't do. How do I know it? Here's a big statement right here that somebody ought to celebrate. God created us to be winners. Everything in the scripture, everything from the beginning of God creating Adam and Eve was so they could walk in power. We were created, created in his image, in his knowledge. We also have the cross of Jesus Christ where Jesus came down and said, you go forward. Resurrection power runs through our body. And every battle we go through, God said there's an eventuality where we should win. I didn't say you weren't going to have to fight. I didn't say you weren't going to have to cry. I didn't say you weren't going to have to go through some stuff. I didn't say you weren't going to have to sit up and wait. I said you will win. That's what you ought to keep your focus on. I will win this battle, and i got to stop losing battles after you win. How do I know God created us winners? Here's the first reason you know. Because God said the battle really isn't yours. It isn't mine. It's his. You ought to look at Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. And we found out that the Amorites and the Moabites came up against Jehoshaphat. And there was a great multitude that surrounded the city. Think about this. But Jehoshaphat had enough sense to get on his knees, and he called the fast. And he proclaimed the time to come closer to God. Can I stop right there and tell somebody, you might not need to listen to the rest of this message if you proclaim a fast right now and just get closer to God on your own. I don't know about you, but there's some times when I am far from God and I know I need to be closer. That's a word from God this morning. Somebody just needs to get closer. But the whole fact called a fast. And you know what happened? The Spirit of God showed up. Did you know you can't fast or do what God said without a power coming down from heaven from God? Think about it. Jehaziel, the son of Zedekiah, stood up. And he said in the 15th verse of the 20th chapter of, of Second Chronicles, he said, Look, uh, all you inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, the Lord is saying, don't be dismayed. Don't worry about this great multitude that has come out against you. He said, because the battle is not yours, it's mine. Here's what God said. Here is why I know we were born to be winners, because the battle is never ours, it is God's battle. What I mean by it's God's battle, think about something. God said, I will fight for you. In Zechariah, I think it's chapter 4, verse 6. I didn't put this down, but it says, Zechariah says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God said, every battle you fight, if you just step back, help me somebody, and trust me, you will win that battle. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by God's spirit that we win this battle. So God is saying our job is to stand. Can I help somebody? Stand this morning. I don't care how many demons are on your back. Stand this morning. I don't care how much struggle. Make up your mind you will not lose another battle in God. The second reason we are winners is because of 1 John 4 and 4. Watch this. The greater one lives in us. Did you hear what God said? That means that everything that comes against you God is still greater than what you're dealing with. So when you're fighting a battle, you need to realize that the strongest, uh, the more powerful, the one who controls everything is on our side. We were made winners because God told us, look, I, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And the third reason we were made winners is 2 Corinthians 2.14. It says, praise be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. That scripture blew me away. Did you hear it? God just said, you always triumph. Somebody get that in your mind uh, when, when the fear comes and the darkness comes and the struggles come. You ought to remember in your mind, I am triumphant. And then Isaiah cleans the whole thing up. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you. To prosper. So you're sitting there losing because I don't know what trick the enemy has done. But did you know the Bible says he can form it, but it won't work. He can form it, but he won't get you if you understand who God is. The reason so many believers are losing with all of this help that I'm talking about is the very fact that God has a standard of holiness 
Ooh, I'm about to lose somebody right now. They say, I didn't tune in to go to no holiness church. Yeah, but you need to understand something. The reason we miss out on our blessing is there's a standard of God. There's a standard of blessing. There's a standard from God of holiness that sets forth in his word. What I like about God is when he said there's a standard, he already explains to us what that standard is because it's set forth in his word. What do I mean by that? Anything in life worth doing has a standard if you're going to be successful. What do I mean? Every marriage may start out with, you know, a, a physical attraction or, you know, where um, her beauty or his chiseled looks, you know, and then they go along and it's just, this intensity builds up and one of them says, oh, and then that first intensity gives fruit to that first, I love you. And then he said, well, you know, I love you too. And then the next stance is everybody moves forward progressively toward, well, we need to get married. Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. But they get married. And here's the key. There's a standard that the man must keep, according to God. There's a standard that the woman must keep. Watch this. And there's a standard they both must keep if they're going to have a blessed and fulfilled marriage. Whatever you do takes a standard. And in this text... Let's go there. It's, it's exciting because it shares with us that Joshua and the children of Israel, watch this, had just come back from defeating the greatest, most armed, superiorly armed nation in Canaan. They had victory. Victory! Time to shout. Hallelujah! I got victory. No, that's your problem. You're trying to live this build, this battle off yesterday's victory. You're trying to live off of a memory instead of creating new memories. What God is telling you is victory is fresh. It's from getting up in the morning and being with God this morning. Yeah, I love God yesterday, but I got to be with him this morning because there's some battles today. It means I was with him last night and I can count a hundred nights before and look forward to a hundred nights in front of me that every day I'm going to be with God because God is letting us know as you defeat or you get a victory and you defeat your biggest enemy, that just means that another one's coming. You got to be ready. Most of the time, Satan operates by coming after us right after victory. Because if we go to the first verse, God's going to show us in this text that Ai was a little area. They had just come back from defeating Jericho. And look what the text said, the first verse. They'll tell us they violated God's standard. It says, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in that Achan went out and touched or took, oh, here's the word, the devoted thing. Hmm. Something that was devoted to the devil, I let in God's camp. Hmm. The devoted thing. Something that was maybe part of my BC days, maybe something that I did before I found God and knew the goodness of God, before I knew how God was blessing me, something that I found and I brought it back and put it in my new saved life. I brought back my old anger, my old unforgiveness, my old bitterness. I brought back my old temptations and my desires. And I started worshiping God and I thought I could worship God and have them. Children of Israel thought, that they were going to be able to touch the accursed thing. But the verse says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled. I don't know about you, but I never, ever want to be in the place where God's anger is focused on me. It's better that God be angry at me than people be angry at me. But my job is I want to please the God I ask all the time, God, are you pleased with me? Somebody ought to stop right now and just ask God that question. Are you pleased with me? I know you weren't looking for a sanctification message. You weren't looking, you know, you want somebody to just tell you how to be blessed and tell you how to get this and get that. But today God said, no, you're losing too many battles because you don't want to be sanctified. Because you don't want to be separated and be holy. Just like those children of Israel, we are going to look today. 
You've had some big blessings in your past. And there's three points I want to take you through that will lead you to this text. Now, I need you to know something. This is going to be a two-part message. I don't know where I'm going to stop today, but I know it's two parts because God has shared with me that this is something that's got to write on. It's just right on. Uh, you know, before I preach to you, i got to go through me. And I know there's some days that I know I need to step, step off and get sanctified. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Here is how you stop losing battles. The first thing is, you got to conquer the battle over your flesh. Conquer the battle over your flesh. A lot of times we say flesh, people think you're talking about sex. I'm not talking about just sexually. I'm talking about your flesh. you got to conquer the battle. Now, I realize that we can't put our flesh down and our flesh stay down and it never gets back up again. But here's what you need to understand. I'm talking about you got to be ready to understand your flesh so you can conquer what, it, what you allow it to do in your life. Secondly, you got to conquer the battle of your strength. You, you, you may not be as strong as you think you are. And i got a secret for you. Even if you are, it doesn't mean you don't need God. Conquer the battle of your strength. It's your thinking that you're strong enough to handle it that led you into that depression to begin with. Conquer the battle of your flesh. Conquer the battle over your flesh. Conquer the battle of your strength. And finally... It's it's very, here's the part that I know it's going to take me a minute to get to, and that is conquer the battle of contentment versus repentance. Sometimes we can get so content, and you're saying right now, I don't need this, I don't know who this message is for, it might be for you. Because sometimes we can get content in our dysfunction, we can get content in where we are. So let's jump right in this. So we find the first verse tells us that you need to understand that where we are in this verse, we saw that it starts out with a but, the first chapter. Because the first chapter here, the first verse in this chapter, the seventh chapter, comes from what happened in the fifth and sixth chapter. In the fifth chapter, after uh, the, the Jordan was dried up and all of the enemies in Canaan heard about it, they got scared and said, we heard what you've done. And at the end, the captain of the Lord showed up. And Joshua went to the captain of the Lord. The angel of God showed up. You know, that's something that God's angel takes time to show up for us. He showed up. Then Joshua said, are you for me or against me? And God said, nothing. I came here to help you. And then that captain of the Lord started telling them what they had to do to win Jericho. That takes us to the sixth chapter. Have you ever looked at the strategy of Jericho? Here's what God said. He told Joshua, you'll march around this walled city. You'll march around six days one time. So they marched six days one time. That got all, can you imagine the trouble getting all those folks up and just march? Then it says on the seventh day, you will march around seven times. But you're going to give the priest, I like God, he always gets the priest in there. You're going to give the priest seven ram's horns and seven trumpets. And when you get to the seventh time around, the priests are supposed to blow those horns and blow those trumpets. And when the trumpets and the horns get to blow and get to shouting, and when the people shout, the walls will fall down. The walls will fall down. That's your victory. I want somebody to understand, if you can get a shout off, you can get a victory. If you can get a shout up this morning, I know, maybe you got to shout through your tears. Maybe you got to shout through a situation that's very repressive and keeps spinning your back. Maybe you're shouting because you don't feel like going on. Maybe you lost that loving feeling to God. I don't know what it is, but if you can get a praise off, I guarantee you, you will turn around your situation. Somebody needs to understand, there's a power in a praise to the goodness of God. There's a power in a praise when I don't feel like praising. Something shakes in my very soul when God begins to get praised in my life. I forget about me and I concentrate on God. Can I tell you something? A praise can heal you. A praise can deliver you. A praise can lift you up. A praise can get that monkey off your back. A praise can put you back in the place where you're excited to get about your journey. A praise can get you right back where you fell from. God said on that seventh day, take the enemy by surprise and just shout. But then we look at verse 18 of the sixth chapter. God said, but when you do, remember 
This is not one of those smash and grab battles. You're on a sanctified journey for me. In the 18th verse, he says, whatever you do, don't touch the accursed, devoted thing. Don't go back. Don't try to have me in memories of what you used to be. Don't let the world lull you back to sleep so you lose my power. Don't get to the point that you forget it's better on this side than it was on the other side. He said, don't touch the thing that's devoted to the enemy. The devoted thing was the artifacts, the the molted, the, the fashion gods of the other nations. He said, don't bring that mess back into my camp. You want the best thing. Quit talking about how good the world was and realize where I brought you from and what I offer you now. He said, don't touch these. Then he said this, the day you do, look at verse 18, he said, you'll bring destruction on yourself. That's what happened. Can I tell you, if you're going to enter into this mess with me and enter into, enter into it real, you need to understand something. The person who does the most damage to your walk, contrary to what you think, is you. You. I don't care what other people do. I don't care what other people say. I don't care what other people bring into your life. You have enough power from God to be able to continue to direct your path without even worrying about what they're doing. And if they are doing something, I just told you, you're a winner. You're going to make it through. But don't ever blame, oh, if all, oh, Lord, if all, God, no, God said it's you. This is what I'm talking about. We all know about Delilah. We all know what she did to Samson. Think about it. She lied to Samson. She tricked Samson. She Cut Samson's hair. She then called the Philistines and allowed them to grab Samson. But don't you dare blame Delilah. Don't you dare talk about how bad Delilah was. The first thing, Samson violated who he was in the Lord. He was told not to violate his bad Nazarite vow and not to violate by sleeping with women from other nations. How are you going to sit back now and be angry and what occurred because of what somebody else did without going back for some self-evaluation and ask yourself, did I rise above the occasion? Did I keep myself surrounded by enough word that that wouldn't affect me? Or am I allowing the accursed thing to control who I am? Oh, somebody's listening to me right now. Do you know the children of Israel were in the promised land? And most of them died in the promised land, not because they didn't have faith. I know they listened to the wrong report, but not because they didn't have faith. They didn't die because of the fact that, you know, they were scared of the enemies around them. Here's why they died. is because they never got Egypt out of them. God took them out of Egypt, but Egypt never got out of you. How long have you been saved? What is still running around in your DNA that came from before you were born. What happened to the new birth and the new power? What happened to when God said, you're going to be blessed and be saved and be lifted above? No, the text tells us they got hooked on the devoted thing. And I told you the first thing is your flesh. Flesh is that part of us that is always predisposed. It's the part of us that is always looking for the ungodly. It's the part of us of that fallen nature that even though we're saved, even though we shout, even though we know the Lord, come on, don't try to act like you don't understand what I'm saying. We got to learn to control our flesh. Paul, with all the writings he did in the Bible, said, I got to keep my flesh under. How come we get so saved? We stop chastising our flesh. Because the Bible tells us that there's a battle going on when you need to understand that the person who does the most harm to you is you because of Galatians 6 and 7. Please understand this. There are people out there. Your loss of battles came because the Bible says in Galatians 6 and 7, be not deceived God is not 
mop. Now, I don't know about you. Here's what it's saying. God's saying, I ain't somebody you all be playing around with. If I give you a word, you better follow it. Now, just because you think, I don't know why, you're big enough to do it without me, then you're, up, you're, you're in trouble. He said, be not deceived. God is not my So ever a man soweth, that shall he reap. Sometimes, I don't understand it, we get some bad spots in our life and act like what we're going through now is not related to how we've been acting. I know nobody don't like me right now. About to cut me off. Can't stay right there. We don't want. We don't want to own up to, and fess up to our need for sanctification. There's many people out there. So the first thing I want to tell you is: be careful how you relate to God. Understand what I'm telling you. You need to understand something. There's some saints out there. I don't know where they got it from. They think they can sit on the proverbial fence. I can commit adultery, I can commit fornication, I can do anything I want to do. And somehow, that text also tells us, when you are mocked, you will not inherit eternal life when you mock God. What am I telling you? First thing you got to understand in Galatians, you got to know that while I'm trying to blame somebody else, be careful, God's not mocked. God loves me. He'll give me everything I want. He'll give me all the favor I want. But he also said, I'm not mocked. Watch this. Be careful how you talk about others. Remember that. Uh, your anger to others, your unforgiveness to others, the way you talk about others, the way you think about other people. Don't ever think that it doesn't come back to you. It's called the law of reciprocity. Many saints have been slain by the law of reciprocity and weren't even aware of it. They thought they were just, oh, just some bad stuff happened to me. God said, no, you picked up that accursed thing. You, you bought back something your flesh like. And here's the worst one. Be careful what you do to yourself. Be careful to do to God. Be careful to do others. But the text tells us, did you know that sin causes sickness and you can be ill and think it's illness, but the stress and the repetitive nature of your sin has built up that it left the metaphysical world of spirit and got down in your body. How do I know? Go with me to Matthew chapter 2. Remember? The paraplegic who they couldn't get in to see Jesus. And it says he had four friends that carried him and they broke the roof down and they took him down. Right? Do you remember that? And when they got him in there, when Jesus looked at his paralyzed, sick body, go to chapter 2, verse 5, and you will see these words here. They astounded me. They said, when he went to heal him, he says, your sins are forgiven. Say what? Sin causes sickness? Yes. Why do you think the word of God said a merry heart doeth good like medicine? But when you operate in sin and unforgiveness and being all the time mean and nasty and bow down, you create sickness. Anybody? I'll give you one more. Chapter 5. Remember the man at the pool of Bethesda? The Bible said Jesus looked at him and said, take up your bed and walk. But go to chapter 14. Go to verse 14 of that fifth chapter. It says Jesus found him later. This messed me up. He found him later in the temple and said, Go thy way. Don't sin no more or a worse thing will happen to you. Worse than what? He had already been paralyzed. God is telling us when you deal in the areas of sin, it brings about a sickness in your entire life. Somebody said, I'm, I'm going to get to a good part. Somebody said, I don't like this message. Here's what I'm trying to tell you is that that battle of light and dark going on within you, you got to settle it. You got to never let it get out of control. I'm helping somebody. You got to get to the point where when I when I cross a line, I know we all been there. How many of us tell, come on, tell the truth. When I find myself crossing over a line that I know is more, God already done showed me that I shouldn't be doing it. I got enough sense by my worship life to pull myself back in and say, mm -mm, I'm not, I don't went far enough. I'm not going no further. Matter of fact, I got to get back to where I came from. And I don't ever want my life in God in the future to be worse than my life was in the past. I want my life in the future to be more powerful. But there's that battle. Uh, Galatians 5.17, the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. They're lusting. Here's what happens. Your flesh don't like it when you talk around, talking about praise the Lord. When you're walking around, uh, the flesh is, is, is want something and you deprive the flesh of it because you're living holy for the Lord. Your flesh lusting now. Your flesh wants to back, be back in control. And if your flesh can't get in control, it messes you up. I was watching a special. 
my wife and I of Michael Jackson. I'm talking about cute little Michael Jackson with the pudgy nose who, you know, had the big afro and was brown. Come on, somebody. And he was singing. He was smiling. I want you back. And he was just singing and jumping. You could tell his spirit was blessed eternally. But then I watched as we were going through this special. And then the surgery started. He didn't like his flesh didn't like how he looked, and he changed his nose. I don't know the number of surgeries they said on this documentary that he had, but then he found himself still not satisfied. You know the flesh is never satisfied. Then he found himself going around and lightening his skin and his whole body and then his hair, and pretty soon he was taking all kinds of drugs. Then he was sleeping in a hyperbarium chamber. Then he was so messed up in his flesh that he had to buy animals to be around him. Then he became a recluse. Then he... All of this happened because his flesh, here was a talent, one of the most talented men I've ever seen in my life was Michael Jackson. But look what happened to him. And then I've already told you the story of the time when Natalie Cole kissed my hand. Oh my God. Still got you. Natalie Cole was top singer. She had, she had, that year she won all the Grammys from Aretha, all of them. And when she got there, we found out that Natalie Cole found herself still empty by not reconciling her love with her father. And she found herself taking heroin, then cocaine. Then her husband died, a heart attack. Then she found herself in rehab. Then she found herself, watch this, Natalie Cole on a corner with hit records. This will be inseparable. She was walking around prostituting herself for cocaine. The flesh. Here's what we know. All of us that got some sense put no faith in our flesh. Can I tell you what to do right now? Celebrate the fact that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Somebody ought to, ought to celebrate your freedom. Tell me God has not given you power to overcome situations in your life. God gave you enough power to overcome all kinds of situations. So what you need to know is it's not the flesh, it's the spirit. Acts 1 and 8. And you shall receive power after the spirit of God has come into your life. It's God's spirit that kept me free. It's God's spirit that wakes me up. It's God's spirit that I rely on. It's that Holy Ghost power in me that has saved me and delivered me and brought me forth. How many know I celebrate God the Holy Ghost? There's a something inside. There's a burning. There's a fire every now and then that lets me know God is on my side. That's what I celebrate. If this flesh can't get me to do anything against God because I realize where my help comes from. God. Let me close with this. There was a young boy. He was out in the park with his father. And his father was teaching him how to fly a kite. And when he began to fly the kite, his father was holding it, and it kept going higher and higher and higher. And the higher it went, the more the little boy got mad. And all of a sudden, he said, Daddy, I can't see the kite. He said, it's just way up there. It's flying. He said, how do I know? He said, I can't. He said, here, son. And he took the string of the kite out of his hand, put it in his son's hand. He says, you feel that? You feel That's the kite still flying with power. What am I telling you? Every now and then, let people say what they want. Let other folk go where they want. I still know. I feel it. There's, there's a pulling, there's a fire that I feel going on inside. Can you help me close right now, please? There's a fire burning on the inside. This Pastor Duncan is telling you, I'm going to pick this point up next week. Don't, don't miss this message. There's, it says that the anger of the Lord, I'm going to tell you how to make sure you can stop losing a battle. But this week, conquer. That battle of your flesh. Tell your flesh, no, we will serve the Lord. What am I telling you? 
Nobody ever treated me like God. There's a God who covers up all my mistakes, who blesses me whenever I'm dead. You ought to know that God right now. He died on the cross for your sins, and if you believe him, you shall be saved. Can you bow with me right here? Father God. Say these words. I need you. Oh, there's somebody out there thank you over spirit. I feel like you say, I need you right now to come in my life. I believe you died. I've tried everything else. But now I'm giving my life to you. I am saved. If you prayed that prayer, you got born again. You are now part of the kingdom of God if you are someone who wants to give to our ministry. But when you go to our website, you see all the great things we're doing. So I just want you to know, first of all, we're concerned about the soul. The Shiloh is not an in-house church. We're outside the wall of church. We do things that help people's lives always have. So in order for you to give, you can go to Give a Five, Shiloh Baptist 2. Just go to Give a Five, Shiloh Baptist 2. You can go to our website, www.shilohbaptistchurches.org, and you can actually go to our PayPal. There's many ways you can get to the ministry. We will appreciate it. Keep this word on the air. And do one more thing for me. Please chat us. Go to our website. Let us know. Instagram, YouTube, Shiloh Baptist TW, wherever you want to go. We will answer you. God bless this pastor. Tell somebody, part two of this exciting message next Sunday morning. To him and leave it there. I was down with no way up and I needed some help. Everybody breathing but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus will set you free. I tried it for myself and now I know what he did.